I think I think we're going to read uh, beginning with verse 11. And we read some of verse 11 and, and a little bit on down from that, but not much. <clears throat> but we want to begin to set up this, th these messages to the seven churches. Um, so let's, let's turn to Revelation chapter 1, verse 11. This is Jesus speaking, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamum, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And I want you to take note of, I, I, I want you all, if you would, to take note of the specifics that we're about to uh, read. In my Bible, I've got a red letter Bible, so there's this little section that we're about to enter into, starting in verse 12, that is not Jesus speaking, but this is, this is what John turned to see. He heard the voice, but this is what he turned to see. Now, I don't expect you to uh, figure out what it is. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, we'll see that right now is not really even important what it is specifically as much as what it is trying to communicate to these churches. <clears throat> okay, so verse 12 now. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girded about the breast with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool. Hey, I don't feel so bad. And, and white as snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. Well, mine are blue, so I missed out on that one. <laughs> and his feet like fine bronze or brass, as if they burned in a furnace. And his voice like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as <clears throat> the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. All right. So there was a multitudinous description that we were given with all sorts of different things. It's not, again, it's not so important that you try to figure out what all that represents. First of all, how can you know what it represents unless you actually know what it was they described? Right now, it's just important to understand the objects and the way in which he was described. <clears throat> okay, uh, in verse 19. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Um, well, I'll wait for a moment. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which thou sawest are the seven churches. All right, so next comes chapter 2 and chapter 3, which are the 
words uh, in my red letter Bible, they are chapter 2 and chapter 3 are completely in red. So that means this is Jesus speaking okay, to these seven churches. All right, now I'm going to read a little introduction here. Uh, and, and in this introduction, um, I will begin to set forth the premise for the whole book. What I ask of you is instead of waiting until Revelation 14 to go, oh, I would like for you to, to, to try to catch it in advance. Um, I will give you plenty of clues. Um, I will pretty much only speak in that direction. Uh, there'll be a little bit that won't be, but because I have to give you a general history. But we're, but for sure tonight, in these two classes, we are going to begin to, if if you have ears to hear, which is what the Spirit said to all those churches too, by the way, you will begin to hear. If not, don't get freaked out, because. Um, the journey is long and there's a lot of building that he's going to do that's really, really, it's really going to be good. And it's really going to be an eye opener as to this book. Now, before I read this little introduction, um, while my approach to the book of Revelation is not <coughs> built on end time prophecy as most people know it I am not discounting that it may not or may relate to those things okay it could well relate to those things but God has shown me an order that even those people that have that end time prophecy thing stumble in certain chapters because they throw a wrench and everything, okay? And the order that the Lord has given me, man, it's just good. He just, he just keeps on going. And he explains what seems to be out of order all of a sudden, the appearance of this and then the appearance of that and all that. It explains, and excuse my Excuse my trying to get hair out of my eyes, but I'm sure none of you noticed that I shaved my beard. You, oh, you did? Okay. Shay Imboden, the prize shall be gathered by you in the hereafter. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, so let me read this. Many in Christianity have placed the book of Revelation into the realm of mythology, having mystical beasts and mystical meanings to the images set forth. Within that framework, they have surmised that its meaning is primarily related to future prophetic events. And notice I said they have sur surmised that its meaning relates primarily to future prophetic events. And I, I have a, okay, I have a, I have a problem with that. And I'm going to tell you why, okay? Um, and you don't have to believe this. In fact, I encourage you not to believe anything I say. If the Lord shows you something, then you believe that. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> if this book primarily relates to future end time events, then that means this book does not relate to all Christians. It only relates to a few Christians at a certain point in time. Does that make sense? That it only relates to the last day Christians. And of course, everybody has thought at some time or another they were the last day Christians only to find out that this book does not relate to them, if you, if you understand what I'm saying, if, if that's true. 
But, but this book is part of the New Testament. And this book um, is in the Bible. Now, every New Testament script, Christian I know that is a fundamentalist says, I believe everything in the book. You know, yeah, yeah except Revelation because, well, what's the point of getting into it? It doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply, huh? God's word. Oh, but it's only God's word about something that's far off. I'm sorry. But there's, if, if indeed there's somewhere mixed into this, the reality of future end time events, that can't be the primary focus of this book, lest it be worthless to everybody but a, a certain few. And I, uh, who was it? Paul said to Timothy that all scripture is given of God for inspiration for da 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 da, all that kind of stuff. Well, it's all given for edification and for building up and to bringing us into the Lord in a greater way. It's not all about, you know, it's not, you know, I'm sorry. It's, it's not like God is like a, you know, I, the only picture that keeps coming to my mind is when we were in Ireland and, and uh, Rayfield and uh, Kim dressed up as the psalm readers. Some of you might have seen the picture, but the pictures, while they are excellent, do not tell the tale fully. Um, you know, that God is some sort of a, like a, you know, a, uh, what is this ball thing? <laughs> Crystal ball reader. Yeah. That he, that he, but he doesn't really use tarot cards. He just kind of goes, okay, you know, here's what's going to happen. See, I, I, I don't think he's that petty. I'm sorry. But I, I, th I mean, I'm just saying that God has got to be larger than just, uh, I got one up on you earthlings that I made, and I made you without certain powers that I have, and I know the future, and you don't, and I'm going to tease you with it. Or scare you with it. You, you know what I'm saying? Or, or you know, and, and uh, put you in a state where you will follow me out of fear because I'm a god of hell, fire, or whatever. Um, I just don't see him as some sort of, uh, you know, oogie boogie man, you know. <clears throat> and I don't see him trying to motivate us by fear. You know, now, you know, people will argue with that, but, <clears throat> yeah, it, it may be a religious view of certain things. And even, even if what the, the view that I'm going to be sharing with you is true, it's not based on fear. It's actually based on hope. It's based, this book is based on hope. And I love that. I love that. <clears throat> Sounds like it was written by my father. Yeah. All right. Um, so, I like the way I worded the last part of that sentence. Within that framework, they have surmised that its meaning is primarily related to future prophetic events that will come upon the earth at, so, at some near yet distant future. <laughs> near yet distant. It's always near but distant, the way it's explained. It's always near. It's, it's right. It's on us. Look out. The end times are on us. I mean, folks, I was, I was younger than you when I first heard this, got saved, and, you know, it's on us. <laughs> and every generation, they freaked out because that's where we're at, near yet distant. And that, that yet distance has gone on for hundreds, oh, I'm sorry, thousands of years. So I'm hoping that one day the book of Revelation will make sense for somebody and that's that's what we keep thinking. That's the deal. All right. 
Um, however, I am persuaded that this letter is meant to give practical, practical explanations as to what the Spirit is seeking to say to the whole church in every generation. Again, you don't have to believe that. <clears throat> All right. The content found in this book was given by Jesus to John. We, we went over that last week. The youngest disciple, the, uh, the one that rested his head on Jesus' bosom. Uh, he was one of the sons of Zebedee. He had an older brother named... James, right. There's Peter, James, and John. He's always last because they always named him Peter, James, and John. And then when they put the books of the Bible in, they changed it up and said, James, Peter, and John. John's still last. <clears throat> but I think there's even reasons for that. Um, he, he had been established by the Lord as one of the original 12 apostles. He later served as pastor at the church of, of, at Ephesus for many years. <clears throat> and by the time he wrote this, he was getting very old. <clears throat> um, and we did mention last class that that is not found in the scriptures, but it is claimed historically that, that he had pastored there in Ephesus for a long period of time. Uh, and that that was where they took him from when they exiled him on the Isle of Patmos. Um, <clears throat> by the time Jesus spoke this book to him, all the other disciples had already died. Had already died. In fact, supposedly John was the only one who wasn't martyred. They know for a fact he does at this point. And you have, to, you have to get out of history and out of sitting here in some sort of Bible school class. And you have to go back and you have to be John. And you have to think, you know, these guys were all older than me. They were all handpicked of the Lord. And they have all lived their lives for the Lord. And they're all dead, killed by someone for what they believe. And John is an old guy now. <laughs> and he's all alone. He's all alone. He's, he, doesn't, he doesn't have one of the old ones he can go to. Makes a difference, folks. Makes a difference. I mean, when my, when my stepfather died, and then I finally met my father, and then he died, and then my mother died, for me, it felt like, you know, before there was a, like a covering over me, some wisdom, somebody I could go to and cry on their shoulder, something, you know what I'm saying. And when they passed away, it was like, oh, oh God, there's nothing between me and Jesus, you know, between me and God. And it was like, I'm responsible. You girls may not feel that, but, you know, it was just like, and I was still pretty young, so it's like, I want somebody to live longer. Well, he was the, the youngest, and they're all long gone, and they all were killed off, okay? And all this is, this is little pieces. We're building a, a wall here. We're building something here. <clears throat> um, at the moment of his writing, he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos as a Roman prisoner. Um, notice how he addresses himself to them and the context in which he puts himself. And this is verse uh, 9 of chapter 1. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation. And in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God, exiled there. It was an island put out there so he wouldn't, couldn't do anything for God anymore. Old guy, shut up. For the word of God. 
and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. All right. So he addresses them in a particular manner, and it's very significant. And it'll become more significant as we see it, because this is his, he's, he's been talking about certain things and factors in the Lord up to this point, but now he's declaring who he is, but he's doing that for the good of the seven churches. Now it is true, because he's in exile. I mean, he's, he's you know, the, historically they say they tried to boil him in oil and he wouldn't boil. You know, <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, um, he, um, it's really hard to describe this, but uh, um, w sometimes we get upset because we're, limitations are put upon us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. And, uh, and, and we don't like those limitations, and, and we think that that those limitations, and here's what we really believe, and I know this because I've, I have been, you know, <clears throat> uh, we don't like those imitation, limitations because we think that this is stopping people from getting the Lord through me. Oh, here it is. Um, you know, there's no way that he could get the pure Lord through anybody else. You know, <laughs> I mean... The Lord needs me. Really? Really? I mean, does he? In the sense of that you're thinking? No. <clears throat> no. Um, <clears throat> he needs earthen vessels. But there is a wrestling that takes place on the inside because, you know, part of it is due to the fact that you have a desire to do something for God. I mean, it's real and it's genuine. I want to glorify the Lord. I want to do something for God. So for God's sake, get me out of this situation. <clears throat> and we usually blame people, you know, because you, you really can't just blame God, you know, because, yeah. you know, stuff happens. But we blame people. So we say, well, this is, this is, you know, I'm thinking back 25 years ago. This is brother so-and-so's fault because the way he is, or this is so-and-so's fault because of this and that. And I want to tell you that in my limitation is where I have started learning the real Lord by life. That's, in fact, I'll tell you, that's where I began an actual genuine change from one who knew the message and knew it well, and when he preached in conferences or whatever, people were impressed, oh baby, uh, <clears throat> to living it and not really having a lot of outlets to, to, to speak it. It was more about living it in those situations. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, many of you that have been around a long time have heard me say this, but life finds a way. Life does find a way. And, and you can't keep it down. In fact, you, all you can do, it's like water. You can, you can push water down, but it's going to go somewhere else until it, you know, it's, just, it's the nature of the, the thing. It really is uh, safe. But, but, but uh, notice he talked about, um, uh, John also, I am your brother and companion in tribulation in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ. Oh, the kingdom, yeah, yeah. patience, you know. No. You know, most kingdom preaching knocks patience out of the way. I mean, it pushes it. Get out of my way! Yeah! You know, and screaming forward. Yeah! For God! For God and country! Well, whatever. Charge! Charge! But that... But, but, but John is in one of those situations. And it's, and it's hard, and yet he's been with the Lord a long time. You know? And I think he's learned. Now, let's just use John as an example. You know, and I don't want to, I really don't want to belabor on this too much, but it's such a golden, 
luscious jewel dropped in the very beginning to go, here's what we're talking about. <laughs> and it's that the Lord put it there, you know what I mean? It's like, guess what? I'm tickling you. Do you get it? You know. <laughs> you know. <clears throat> um, but so, so um, So he's, he's got this um, bondage, as it were, and he's stuck on this island. And I, I was a missionary. My wife and I were missionaries on Jamaica for years in a very small island, uh, 50 miles across. Um, <clears throat> you know, long was, I think, 75 miles. Very small island. And, and if, you, you know, if you've never been put on an island with the thought that this is where you're going to spend the rest of your life, you realize that you there's nowhere that you can run to if you freak out. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, you know, <clears throat> and thoughts would come to your mind that you'd never, you know, it's like, God, you know? I mean, I can't even go run down to, you know, McDonald's. You probably can now, but you couldn't back then. I can't run down to McDonald's somewhere um, and, and sit in there and, and feed my flesh and go, you know, self-pity, here, eat these McDonald's french fries, they're so good, it'll comfort you, you know. <clears throat> you know, <laughs> I couldn't even do that, you know. Uh, most of you can look at me and go, I don't think he does that, but some people do, <laughs> but some people do. <clears throat> some people right up close here, but I won't tell you who. <clears throat> You're way back there, Mike. I am not picking on you this time. <laughs> All right. So he's on this island, but he's a prisoner on the island. So he doesn't even have the full run of the island. He's a prisoner on the island, and he's limited. And they, he was pastoring this the best church. I mean, if you read the uh, Epistles, you know, the, the, uh, the Ephesians really were in tune with the reality of Christ and him crucified. And he's, and he's you know, he's been taken out of that and he's old now and he's going into his final years and all this stuff. And he, he looks to one side of the island, there's an ocean I can't get around. And he looks to the another side and there's the Mediterranean Sea and the Mediterranean Sea all around. And he can't get, he can't go anywhere. And he, he could just fall into despair. But then all of a sudden the Bible says that he was, in the, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and a door in heaven was opened to him and a voice saying, come up here. <laughs> well, there goes man's limitation, you know. Uh, <clears throat> I think the Lord will keep us in, limita in limitation and all of that until we figure out that, and, and I know what I'm talking about even right now. I've had to embrace certain things that, you know, if you don't embrace it, it'll, it'll strangle you. You know what I mean? You embrace it, or it embraces you. <clears throat> um, but, but when you do and you recognize that all the avenues that you thought and had come up with as a possible solution to the release of your special Jesus, <laughs> your special talents, whatever, um, <clears throat> have been shut down. All of those have been shut down and you're okay with that because you believe like in the Song of Solomon that uh, uh, he says, you are like a garden shut up, shut in. And the Lord says, blow my winds. And he brings the winds and he brings the fragrance over the walls, it says, and out to the people. Well, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. And he's doing it in ways that we can't imagine and, and wouldn't have dreamed of. And it's way more effective and it'll touch way more people. And it's, you know, I mean, here John is caught up in heaven. And I mean, he's seeing all this. And, Whoa, you know, this is nothing like Patmos, you know. <clears throat> and he's just full of, full of the Lord, full of the Lord. Um, so that sets that stage uh, for him to say to them, I, your brother in tribulation, your co a companion, your companion. 
Because why? Because he's actually in Patmos still writing these letters and sending them off. And he's saying, I'm in a pretty bad situation here, but I want to talk to you about the unveiling of Christ. <clears throat> All right. So, um, the book begins with a series of messages from Jesus to the seven churches of Asia Minor. From the specific information given in Jesus' messages to each church, we might surmise that these seven churches are shown to have many faults that needed correcting and were assaulted by a variety of outward enemies. That little sentence right there is important. All right, so let's step in here a little deeper. Um, remember, the church as founded by Jesus himself had been in, in existence for about 60 years at that point. I don't know, I'm just guessing honestly, but about that, I mean, I would assume John was probably around 30 and had been, he's in his 90s now, so, <clears throat> Um, you know, that's a pretty long time since the, since the resurrection. You follow me? That's a, that's a pretty, that's good. That's a good, you know, if you were 30 and now you're 90, that's a good amount of time to sort of get your footing. Would you, would you not agree with that? <clears throat> Same for the churches. <clears throat> Excuse me. One would think that by that amount of time, the worldwide church would have been walking in victory and showing forth the glory of our Lord's resurrection, right? I mean, wouldn't you think that? I mean, especially in light of the book of Acts. Because that's what everybody thinks it was all like. So, oh my God, this explosion took place and... But we're seeing a little bit different picture here, book of Revelation. <clears throat> Instead, the people of God were small in number, in a weakened state, and the condition of things in their lives had reached a tipping point where all seemed virtually out of control due to daily trials and problems. These churches were in the midst of persecution from the Roman Empire and from the Jews. All right. <clears throat> we're going to... This is what we're going to start developing here pretty quick, <clears throat> but I want to, uh, I wasn't initially going to do it this way, but now we're going to get into the thing that I talked about at the end of last class, where we're going to look at these seven churches, and, and uh, I'd ask you, and I'm sure every one of you did this, to look at each church in light of uh, being assailed by what problems, meaning from without, having what kind of problems from within, and what is the answer. Okay, y'all remember me saying that. Amen. I'm proud of you for remembering that I said that now. Now that I said it. That's okay. There is, the only homework is what the Holy Spirit puts on you to live Christ, which is harder than anything I could ever give you. All right. So let's look at uh, chapter 2, and verse 1. Uh, for unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, or candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them who are evil, and thou hast tried them who say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and... For my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from where thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of its place except thou repent. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans and which I also hate. And you know what? Uh, I, 
I learned many of this, this weird names of the Bible by listening to Bible cassette tapes by Alexander Scorby. Anybody ever anybody know Alexander Scorby? Now, I haven't listened to this in years, but I swear he called them the Nicolaitans. And the, it ends with a tan, not a shun. Anyway, <clears throat> sorry, but um, <clears throat> let's see. Verse 7, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. All right, that's the Ephesians. Okay, they are assailed by what problems? Well, verse 2, they're bearing with evil. Okay, they're bearing with evil. All right. Uh, verse 2, they've been invaded by those who say they are apostles. Number 3, um, they have, and this is still in verse 2, they have borne to bear, to bear something. They have borne and labored is the words that are used there. Um, that's, that's some of the problems that is assailing them from the outside. What are the problems on the inside? Jesus addresses one thing. You have left your first love. He didn't say, well, you sinned. Or, you know, you've been cheating on your finances. Or you've been, you know what I mean? All the things that we would go, well, this is, this is the horrible stuff. For one, for the bridegroom, for the one who's in love, for her to leave her first love is more devastating than if she was stealing money out of his wallet. Okay, we read that and we go, well, thank God they didn't do anything bad. You know, <laughs> just slap Jesus in the face, the bridegroom Jesus, not just the Savior or whatever. <clears throat> Pardon? Very Martha-like. Yeah. Very Martha-like. Martha-like. It's a new, powerful plastic. It's called Martha-like. It's very, yeah, that's right. All right. Now, I'm not going to comment a whole lot on this right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go to Smyrna because we want to get through this two chapters. And unto the angel of the church of Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last who is dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them who say they are Jews and are not, and are of the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that hath an ear, uh, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. <clears throat> All right. Um, the problems that they're being assailed by is pretty much the it's pretty much all outward things that's coming against this church. He didn't really address any inward problems within, which is pretty cool, huh? I mean, I think it is. I mean, you know, if the Lord wanted to come to deal with me, I'd hope he'd go, you know, they, you got some problems here, you know, pointing outwardly instead of going, dude, you are a nest of my enemies. <clears throat> some of you know what I'm talking <laughs> All right, so uh, what problems are they assailed by outwardly? Uh, verse 9, tribulation, tribulation, and poverty. Tribulation, you know, not problems. You know, tribulation. I, I think there's a difference between what we call problems and actual tribulations. Um, also dealing with blasphemy and the synagogue of Satan. Not only that, but the devil is going to cast them in prison and they're going to be tried and have tribulation. And he said, well, be faithful unto death. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Let's move on to the third one. Um, did I skip my little... Yeah, here it is. Pergamum. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church of Pergamum write, These things saith he who hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's throne is. And thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my, uh, my faith. Even in these days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. And I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth except he that receiveth it. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to use this church, although we could go pretty much to the rest of them also, <clears throat> but I'm going to stop right here to identify something. If you'll notice, um, uh, in verse 12, the last part, he says, These things saith he who hath the sharp two-edged sword. And if you'll notice in the other ones, um, <clears throat> these things saith he, this is Smyrna, these things saith the first and the last who is dead and is alive. Um, and then Ephesus, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Has anybody noticed the examples that it's giving of the one that's speaking to them? <clears throat> okay. Now, what we do is we get caught up in trying to figure out the meaning of, well, what does it mean about the sword there? Or what is the seven candlesticks that he's doing there? Or what is the, you know, all this stuff. <clears throat> but he said over here in the first chapter, um, uh, right, let's see, where is it? Write the things which thou hast seen. What is it that they have seen? Just before this is the scriptures I identified to you that are not in red, that are mentioned about Jesus, the thing that they have seen past tense. Seen is past tense, am I right? Yes. Grammar? Yes. Grammar check? <laughs> seen is past tense, and we automatically assume, well, he's talking about stuff that you saw when you first became a Christian or something like that. But I think he's talking about this because these are the very issues that are coming up. He's, he's bringing up several different things. He's bringing up what the, what the problems are coming from without that are plaguing them, the problems from within, how to overcome. But he's also describing himself as the one who's saying this this is the revelation of him that he's talking about. The revelation of Christ. And he's saying, I'm speaking to you. Now don't get into, try to get into the meanings as much as to first recognize that he's revealing himself to them. He already did reveal himself to them. And in, in, uh, we're already in chapter 2. This is uh, chapter 1, verse 12 through 17. He's already revealed himself to them. He's described him in very specific ways. And now he's coming to them and saying, thus saith, you know, this, the guy that was supposedly revealed to you. <clears throat> All right. So from that, we can assume that even though we don't get it, he considers that he has revealed himself to us. Okay? And he comes on the basis of what he has done in relationship to revealing himself to us. <clears throat> now, do we need to 
catch up with the revelation of Christ? Yes, you know, I mean, in other words, what I mean by that is we need to seek the Lord. We need to seek to understand what he's saying of himself, not of what he's saying of these symbols. Does that make sense? Not of what he's saying of these symbols because he's talking about how he's revealed himself. We need to see, and I think they wouldn't have the problems that they have if they had been walking in the revelation of him that, they, that he had already presented. And maybe, just maybe, instead of them seeing him, maybe they heard a bunch of symbols and were trying to figure them out and went for a long time and couldn't and said, well, maybe someday in the sweet by and by, God will reveal all these little symbols and this, you know, this white stone and these seven lamp stands. And, but I don't get it right now. It's not about not getting it, the explanation of little objects. You're never going to understand the explanation of little objects. These are a revelation of him. That's what I turned to see the voice. He's seeing the voice. In other words, he heard the voice. Now he's seeing what was declared, and it is in terms of these things, but it is a, it is a him, and the only explanation you're ever going to really fully get is to see the Lord. And only the Holy Spirit can do that. So he says, hear what the Spirit says to the church. Well, what do you think the Spirit is saying to the church? Jesus. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Also, I want to point out that in every one of these cases, there's only one answer given for every one of these ch seven churches. And that is what? He that overcometh. Every one of them have that little epithet. He that overcometh. Now, that's going to be a huge key for what he's going to start talking to them because they clearly don't have a revelation of Christ. They have not laid hold of it. Again, maybe they have sought Jesus for the meaning of objects and not sought Jesus. So clearly they're lacking in knowing him. And what is he going to do? Well, I can, I'll tell you exactly what he's going to do. He's going to seek to open himself, to reveal himself, to unveil himself to them further. <clears throat> okay? And every one of them, every person in every church is going to come by way of one reality. He that overcometh. Okay. All right, I am familiar with what, you know, people of the, it's all about the future prophetic events, and, and I know that what it means to overcome to most of them is, you know, uh, you got to keep believing to the end. You know what I mean? You got to, in other words, can I just put it succinctly? You got to, you got to stay saved. You got to stay safe, even even through, you know, the beasts that start rising out of the land and out of the sea. You got to got to just stay saved. Yeah. Um, I will say this, and then I need to stop. Um, God has a wonderful plan that he's setting forth here. God has a wonderful plan. And he's already talking about it. And he's already building these seven churches toward it. Because guess what? I'll just go ahead and cheat a little bit. These seven churches that are at the beginning here, in the end, they end up being the bride. Okay, right? The very end, the spirit and the bride say, come. It's the very end of the book. Well, right here, he's dealing with them, and they don't know what they're about to be put through or whatever, but he is faithful, and it's it, it, when seen, when actually <clears throat> beholding the heart of the Lord in the plan of the Lord, because, you know, it's not just some dry plan like, well, you know, I'm going to make a plan before I create earth, and this is what it's going to be right here, and, you know, we're going to follow the plan, you know. 
<laughs> what was it? Stick with the, I can't remember what it was. Um, you have to see the heart of the Lord to understand the plan of the Lord. <clears throat> so that, that's another reason why we must seek him to be revealed and not the objects and all of the weird stuff. Because they're all explained by him and are all given to the church here in all of these, these things as an excellent, thus saith the one, you see what I'm saying? You know, the one that's speaking here is related to these things. Know them, you'll know the one who's speaking. Okay? All right, let's take a break and we'll come back. We're right in the middle of Pergamum.